y'all that's it for me hey give a warm welcome to our friend nick laparra thank you gosh colin is a hard act to follow i'm not that funny my wife reminds me all the time but colin just like naturally like super funny um good morning everyone i'm so excited to be in this room with you all this is this is an honor uh in a lot of ways because What's really fascinating is that most of you all are much smarter and much more talented than I am, and yet somehow I get to be up here and speak. You all are doing such incredible things. I actually realized what I just said. I said most of you all are smarter and more talented, which means I also said that some of you are not. And I don't really mean that. You all, you all are so smart and so talented. Um, but I am, uh, I'm really excited. I'm really excited. I didn't mean to start with uh, insults right from the beginning. <clears throat> I'm here this morning, the theme is compassion, and what a theme. We need way more of that, and we're gonna get a little bit into that. And there's a million different directions I could take this, and today we're gonna talk about doing the right thing because your life and your legacy depend on it. Doing the right thing, if you got one of those posters, it's one of my favorite Martin Luther King Jr. posters, doing the right thing because your life and legacy depend on it. After winning the Nobel Peace Prize, Martin Luther King Jr. gave uh, his second talk at Oberlin College, October 22nd, 1964. He said a lot of important things, but one of the most important things that he said that day was, the time is always right to do what is right. Thanks, Martin Luther King Jr. for stating the complete obvious, but, and it is obvious, right? It's always the right time to do the right thing, but we don't live that way, do we? I mean, honestly. Think of the last 24 hours of your life, 36, 48, the last week. Did you always do the right thing when it was the right time to do it? I know I have not. Today, I'm going to talk about how this applies to our life and legacy, why it's important to always be thinking about our life and legacy as the amazing, the amazing creatives that you are. I have some dear friends in this room. I'll point some of them out later. I'll embarrass them a little bit that know me very well but 99% of you don't know who I am. So I wanna give some context as to who I am, what I, a little bit about what I've done, and why I am here today speaking to you. My dad was, uh, came to the US when he was a little boy. He ran away from home uh, because, uh, so I guess he's technically a refugee. He's definitely an immigrant from Guatemala. It was war torn, so much violence. Ran away from home to get away from the violence. Came here, his family came running after him. And so my family was, uh, you know, we were, we were all born here. Uh, when I was nine years old, we moved to Guatemala. My parents were missionaries, and so we moved to Guatemala. So when I was nine, we moved there, spent 10 years there. It was still the first three or four years that I lived in Guatemala were right at the tail end of the same civil war that he had left when he was a young boy. And oddly enough, you'd think at the end of a war, the violence would come down. Well, it skyrocketed for a few years because you had hundreds of thousands of guerrillas that didn't know anything else then. They tried to work, they tried to get jobs, and that didn't work out. They resorted to all the things they were doing before. So we grew up in a very volatile, dangerous place. I've seen things that no kid should ever see. I've seen people get murdered right in front of me. I saw a guy get hacked to death with a machete when, like, 100 feet from me. I used to be kidnapped. There was an attempted kidnapping on my life all sorts of things. So I grew up in a place where we were always tiptoeing around life. We were always looking behind us, looking in front, looking to our sides, not always sure if we were going to actually make it back home that day, right? Um, when I was 13, I was encountered with my first real opportunity to serve someone else that I didn't know on a long, in a long-term basis. So I began volunteering. We met this lady. She uh, helped she, she helped run this volunteer crew at this hospital. Terminal cancer kids, they're not gonna live. 
They need someone to love them, hug them, play with them, read books to them, just, just be with them as they eventually would die. So I started volunteering there every week, every, you know, every twice a week or so. That began to transform me because I was encountered at 13 years old, even though I lived in like a really weird place and there were needs everywhere, that was my first opportunity to love someone and serve someone out of my own volition. That began to change me. Then when I was 15, my parents, they were already crazy enough to have, oh, I forgot to mention that I'm one of 12 kids. So they took, at the time, nine children to war-torn Guatemala. They had three more when they were there. They're a little crazy. They have no hobbies, obviously. They're amazing, though. Um, but, so yeah, we're this huge family in this like really crazy place. When I was 15, I said, I wanna go to Peru to visit this orphanage and hang out there for a few weeks, love the kids, help them out, they need some help. They said yes. So I bought a plane ticket, uh, met a complete group of strangers in Peru, Peru uh, and spent a few weeks there. And that just began, that, those types of things increased my love for people, my love for always looking for opportunities to serve and help other people. Um, then when I finished high school, I spent six years uh, traveling the world. So then I joined this group that most of our work was humanitarian and social good in nature, traveled all over the world, spent time in 20, 25 countries um, on almost all the continents. And that, again, that, so that was, that's more of my journey, more opportunities to serve and love people. And I can't, those, I've seen things in my life that I can't come back from. I've spent time with people, some of the most amazing people on the planet, people you'll never hear about, you'll never see, you'll never meet, that radically changed my life, radically changed my outlook on everything. I can't, you can't undo that stuff. And so I kept trying to, because I, I knew what that felt like now, I knew how it was affecting me, how it was changing me, I began to continue to put myself in opportunities that made me uncomfortable and where I would continue to see, where I would continue to be challenged and I would continue to see different ways to serve people and love people. Then I began a family of my own, got married, uh, met my wife while I was traveling the world for those six years. Um, we settled down in Minneapolis. We moved right into Phillips neighborhood. 120 languages spoken in that neighborhood in Minneapolis, predominantly Somali refugees. Again, so many opportunities to serve and love and always encountered with hurt and pain, intolerance. And um, then we moved, uh, just spent four years in Tacoma, uh, had two of my three kids there. I have three kids now. That brings you to six, 18 months ago. 18 months ago, my family and I decided to leave Tacoma, Washington, just south of Seattle, to move closer to family. So 18 months ago, Colin mentioned we were here for five, or I was here for five months. We thought we were moving to Nashville. This is a great city, guys. I love it. But I've never lived in the south. So when we landed here in March of last year, it didn't work out. It didn't work out for a lot of reasons. Couldn't find the right neighborhood, couldn't find the right house, couldn't find a place where we felt comfortable and where we would be around the kinds of people that we wanted to be, see the kinds of things we wanted to see, put our kids in the kind of situations we wanted to put them in. So that began the last 16, 17 months of my family vagabonding around. We've been staying most of the time with my in-laws in East Tennessee, but I, we have been everywhere. Um, a few weeks into this vagabonding, season of vagabonding, I decided to continue. So when we left Tacoma, we sold everything we owned except for what we could stuff in the back of our minivan. Drove that across the US, but we, basically everything was gone except for 10 tubs, a few suitcases, um, and a pair of deer antlers. Don't ask, I don't even know why we kept them, but we had them. Um, I know that was awkward, right? Uh, we found them under our porch, cleaned them off, and just set them on our mantle. And it was just became, like, I've never hunted in my life. I don't like to hunt, we're vegetarians, but I found this pair of deer antlers, <laughs> and so I kept it on, uh, on our mantle. It just looked cool. I can see why people do hang that stuff up. Um, anyway, I'm back. We moved with very few things, and then a few weeks into our 18 months, I had been living out of these two bags. So personally, I had my backpack, which is over there in the corner, I had a duffel bag, and that's all I was living out of. And a few, uh, about two months in, I was like, okay, we haven't landed anywhere, we haven't decided where we wanna go, and I've been in these bags, I was actually staying at my buddy Spencer house, Spencer's house, and I was like, I, I haven't needed anything outside of these two bags for, 18, for, for two months now. Can we keep doing this? Like, can I keep doing this? And so um, we, I was talking to my, my other alter ego, I guess. Can we keep doing this? Yes, we said that we could keep doing it. And so I began to, to just, I began to start experimenting with, with different things in my life to try to, because I really liked how I was thinking, my clarity of mind, taking distractions and decisions out of my life. 
And uh, so I kept living out of these two bags. And for the past 18 months, I've lived out of these two bags 100% of the time. I wear black t-shirts and black shirts every single day. It gets kind of, uh, most people are just very predictable. But I can just reach in and grab anything that feels like a pant and a shirt, and I'm ready to go. I started doing these other experiments to kind of regain uh, minutes and hours of my week and day, from my day and week back. I started uh, eating the same thing for lunch every day. So for three to four months at a time, I eat the same thing. There's no decision making there. I know what I'm gonna do, I know what I'm gonna make. It saves me minutes a day. And I started, uh, then I started doing intermittent fasting, which saves me another chunk of my day because I don't eat from 9 p.m. until 1 p.m. the next day. Uh, I started watching way less you know, like most people, I, you know, would watch five or six TV shows at a time, right? With my family, with my wife. I cut that down to one so that I could save hours more a week. And then this is the weirdest one, but it's been a fun experiment. I started showering once a week. Today's Friday. Uh, Sunday morning is shower day. You're, you're more than welcome to come and take a sniff. Let me know if I should keep <laughs> doing that experiment or not. But think about how much, I, I'm not, don't feel shamed if you shower every day or twice a day. But just think about how much time I've saved by not the, the t cutting out that 10, 15, 20 minutes a day of showering. So all in all, I've, I've, I've gained back five, six hours of my life that I have begun to think very intentionally about, right? I have, these, I have all these experiments in my life, all these exper experiences in my life, all over the world, 30 plus countries, and I'm just continually trying to figure out, okay, I, what am I gonna do with this time that I'm regaining back? What am I gonna do with the very short time that I have on this earth? Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu said, be content with what you have, rejoice in the way things are. When you realize that there is nothing lacking, the whole world belongs to you. Think about that for a, for a second. Be content because when you realize that there, is no that there is nothing lacking, that you have everything you need to be the most successful version of yourself, Think about how much that opens everything up to you. Think about how, much, much, how many opportunities and possibilities that opens up to you. So what does, you know, fewer things to play with, fewer decisions to make, fewer distractions to engage in these experiments that I've been doing have given me back something very valuable. And I've already mentioned it once, but time. More time means more space to do the most important things. While uh, consulting and coaching, that's a bulk of my work, um, different colleagues and clients of mine, one of the first questions that I inevitably get to, because I've had to put myself through the ringer with this question this year, is why haven't you done that thing or those things that you always talk about doing but never get to? Whether it's a passion project or a hobby or a new business. And almost every time, what do you think their answer is? I just don't have time, right? Almost, it just, like, it just falls out of their mouths. I just don't have time, right? None of us, none of us has time. And I'm ready for this now. I'm, I'm ready, I'm queued up, because I know what they're gonna say most of the time, and I always respond, hopefully, I hope they hear empathy, but just with a fervent passion, no friend, all you have is time. That's the only thing that you and I have a lot of. We have the same amount of. And today, today is the only day that matters. Now, this isn't simply about these things that I'm talking about. It's not simply about getting more stuff done. This, this time that I'm saving every day and every month, week and every month. It's not about getting more stuff done, it's about getting the right stuff done. I want you to hear this because I don't want what I'm talking about today to come across as uh, judgy or that I'm looking down on you because I, I need this every day just as much as I'm, you know, of what I'm trying to convey to you. We're all, that, the poster that he talked about, Nick, Nick Dom's poster, I, I don't know what I'm doing. Like that is so incredibly true. We're all just trying to make it, we're all, uh, excuse my crassness, but we're all fuck ups just trying to fuck up a little less the next day and love more people and serve them. That's just the reality of it is that I'm not going to get up here and try to put on a show and tell you that I figured it out and that everything's A-OK. -okay. These last 18 months when I've been doing all this experimenting have been the most, like they have been the hardest months of my life. But they've also, which is odd that life can work out this way, they've also been the most fruitful and the most beneficial. And I've met the most amazing people and I've done the most amazing stuff. But we never get to experience that if we don't put ourselves in a place where we have the time to do the right, to do those things. Where we, where we don't put ourselves into the place where we have less things in our lives. And it's not about owning less things either. It's about owning the right things. So most of you, many of you will not go out and do what I've done. 
with the two bags. And I feel like I want to just keep doing it, even if we eventually, we will end up eventually land somewhere. I feel like I just want to keep living that way because it's a, it's, a, it's a daily reminder to me to not care about that stuff and that there are more, you know, important things to care about. So I want to free myself up and open myself up to have maximum impact, to do the things and own the things that help me use my time more wisely, and to do and own things that give me energy and not take it away, not suck it away. I want more time in my life for spiritual, emotional, physical, and mental space for people, right? So here's the shift where we're going to start talking about the theme of this month. We cannot be a compassionate people. We cannot live with compassion. We can't think about compassion. We can't feel compassion if we have filled up every nook and cranny of our lives with stuff. And stuff is tangible things, distractions, decisions. You've already seen that not everything is like just physical stuff. But we can't be open to that if we have filled up every area of our lives. Our, 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 our bodies, our minds, our souls, our spirits, they're, they're vessels that you can only put so much stuff in, right? Like once it's full, your coffee cup, if you just keep putting stuff in it, it will overflow in no time. Well, our lives are, aren't any different. If you fill it up with stuff, you have no room or capacity to feel and to implement compassion. So I want that space for people because people matter most, right? You will not, uh, one of the books that I'm going to write someday is, I'm, I want to document and talk through the deathbed confessions of people, both people that um, thought life was primarily about things and stuff, lots of exotic cars, lots of homes, lots of stuff, and then also people that didn't have any of that. And I want to hear their words. I want to hear what they have to say. I want to hear them talk through the regret or, on the other side, say, I don't regret a damn thing that I did because I made it about people. I made it about, I didn't have the stuff that so-and-so had, but I made it about people. So Martin Luther King Jr., um, two quotes from him. He wins. He's awesome. He's one of my heroes. But he said that life's most persistent and urgent question is this. So here's Martin Luther King, right? One of the greatest men that I think I'll ever have the opportunity to learn from in so many different ways. And what did he communicate was the life's most persistent and urgent question? Super simple. What are you doing for others? What are you doing for others? Really, Martin Luther King Jr., the most, the biggest and most persistent and urgent question is that? And I believe him. I don't always live it out super well, but I believe him. I really believe that's true because I've seen it take place in my life. I've seen that actually happen where I'm the happiest, most fulfilled version of myself when it's about people. I've spent the last uh, two decades, um, I guess, yeah, since 13, I'm, I just turned 34, the last two decades engaged in humanitarian work all over the world. And what those experiences have given me is a bigger worldview. And what this bigger worldview has given me is a greater desire to focus on the most important things, which always involve people. Um, in my, in my lifetime and in my children's lifetime, I would, for example, love to see the 660 million people that don't have clean water get clean water. I would love to see the 800 million undernourished people become nourished. I would love to see hundreds of millions of people lifted out of poverty and begin to make a decent living for themselves, for their families, and for their communities. But I can't properly engage in those issues, address those issues, or be concerned about them if stuff owns me. Okay, so why am I doing these things? Why am I living this way? Why the experiments? Why the once a week shower? There's an ancient practice that dates all the way back to Socrates called memento mori. It's a Latin term for remember death. This is, uh, <laughs> it's a weird thing to say at this like fun uh, creative event. But seriously, memento mori, remember death or remember you will die. It's the intentional practice of reflecting on our mortality. It's the, it's the practice of running all of our ideas, our dreams, our ambitions, our disciplines, our behaviors through the simple grid of, 
I'm going to die. And I think about death very often. I think you should too. I think it's I think it's a little foolish not to. Here's why. Because I believe that the most compassionate, loving, caring, successful people that I've ever met are people that reflect on their mortality and the brevity of life often. And I, but here's, here's, here's the change. I don't look at death morbidly or hopelessly. I look at it hopefully because after death, something really cool happens. It's called legacy. After death, our legacy. What will my legacy be? What will people talk about after I die? Because here's the deal. We could live to 165 if Elon Musk can hurry up and help us figure out how to live that long, and I hope he does because I would really love to live to 165. Or you could get hit by a bus on the way out of this building today. That's just the start. That's the reality. You and I aren't guaranteed one more minute of life. One of my first encounters with that was when we lived in Guatemala, I took uh, karate classes for five or six years. One of my really good friends, um, she, uh, was, she was in the class with us, and she was the happiest, most joyful, just, just fun to be around. And we had class on a Thursday, and then again on a Friday that week. She went home, we went home, we went home. I came back the next day for class. She didn't show up. Everybody's like super crying. I'm like, what's going on? Uh, last night, uh, Jimena, that was her name, she tried to kill her family and she killed herself. She tried to poison everybody. And like, you just don't, like, I'm 13 or 14 at the time, not thinking about death, not thinking just about like the bigger scope of life. I'm doing 13 and 14 year old stuff. But all of a sudden, that was the first time when I was faced with this like, how did that happen? She was just here. We were just here having fun, doing karate class. She's not here the next day. And obviously, as I've gotten older, I've had different encounters with that as I've uh, gotten older. But seriously, what will our legacy be? What will, will it be that we watch all the TV shows? Will it be that we did all of our work in the most self-serving way only to advance our own means? Will it be that we took care of our own needs first and foremost? I have... People that know me, I have the next 10 years of my life super planned out. Many of you probably do as well, right? But those plans must remain somewhat on the back burner so that we can focus on today, the people we're going to meet today, the situations we're going to meet, encounter today. Because truthfully, we can plan. I think planning is great. I have done the plans. But if we don't focus on what's happening today, we have to realize that what we're doing today directly affects our legacy. The people we encounter, the stuff we do, good decisions, bad decisions, they all directly affect what our legacy is going to be. And our legacy is going to long, hopefully, outlive the lives that we're living. Again, our lives are super short. So what does this have to do with compassion? It has everything to do with compassion. Um, in case you haven't noticed, we live in a like an extremely volatile political climate, societal climate. Things aren't amazing. If you spend time on the Twitter or if you engage in conversations and anything like even kind of political, you know that just things aren't hunky-dory. And so I have just chosen to just engage that reality, that things aren't hunky-dory and that there, there are so many things to be grateful about life. Like there's so many things to be so happy about in um, life is to be enjoyed and around the table and with friends and let's keep creating. That's not what I'm getting at. My point is though, there's a lot of pain, a lot of hurt. Tonight at the live podcast recording, we're going to raise money for uh, Hurricane Harvey relief. Um, and when I, when I had planned to, when I chose my friends at Preemptive Love, we're going to raise money for them because they're right on the ground in Houston. When I chose that, Irma hadn't happened. The, the earthquake in Mexico, like since I chose, let's, let's, let's send a couple thousand dollars to uh, Preemptive Love so they can do the work better at, her, at Hurricane Harvey. Several more, just like really huge things have happened, right? So we have to, we have to think through these things. That's my point. We have to engage them. And I, my point today is I want you to focus on, I want us to focus on what are the most important things. 
Harold Kushner said that our souls are not hungry for fame, comfort, wealth, or power. Our souls are hungry for meaning, for the sense that we have figured out how to live so that our lives matter. And I really believe that's true. I I sincerely believe that's true about you and about me. Your body and soul might be telling you that fame, comfort, wealth, power matter, and they will matter for a little bit, but what your soul is truly hungry for is meaning. So ask yourself that question. The theme is compassion. There are, there are hundreds of thousands of people around the world coming to these creative morning gatherings, engaging the topic of, topic of compassion. Are you doing the things that are fulfilling the meaning that your soul is craving for? I stand, with, I stand and sit with 200 plus people that are I'm really proud of you guys. I don't know half of you, but I've engaged just a few of you today. Jara and Nate and Nick and a lot of my friends are here. I'm so proud of the work that you're doing. I talked with Nate for a few minutes about the, the, the powerful nature of what's happening here this morning. The 200 of us, in a focused way, can do amazing things for this city. We can address some of the biggest problems. We can end some of the biggest hurts. We can make the coolest shit ever. This is amazing what's happening here. There's there's such a powerful thing happening here. So much skill, so much talent. So keep going, keep doing this. My only request of you today is that when you wake up every day, alongside the amazing stuff that you're doing, ask these questions. Am I building toward my legacy today? Am I ready to serve those around me? Am I aware of the needs around me? Am I woke, as it were? I like that term. But seriously, are you cognizant? Are you aware? Do you have eyes that can see the needs so that you can use your skills, your talents, your time, the work that you do, the amazing work that you do, to make sure that compassion is a very integral part of what you do. As I begin to close, hear me loud and clear. My intention is not to call anyone out. I've been told that sometimes the way that I present myself, very passionate, very emotive, like it can come across as like, ah, that's not my intention. My intention, please don't feel that way. I want you to feel hopeful and excited about your life and legacy and what you have the ability to accomplish both alone And then in a much more powerful way when you link arms with the people around you. So, are you in? Okay. Because here's the cool thing. I know that so many of you are already doing this. Don't hear me, don't hear me speaking to you like, okay, ready to, now start doing it after this. So many of you are already doing this. My friends, Spencer and Jeb, inly.io, one of the coolest products out there for invoicing. They're like, I'm in the, I've seen them build this thing from the ground up and they're always talking about how can we serve people, love them better. They're gonna start this dollar club to like engage like real projects around the world. Beth Matthews, who spoke to you last month or the month before, the mom bag, help giving amazing stuff to refugee moms and the immigrant run eateries.com. Uh, so many, so many things are already happening in this room. Andy is here with his crew. They're doing a TV show about the messiness of philanthropy and humanitarian work around the world and showing true heroes that are doing this work around the world. So it's happening. I pointed out three people that I know, but I bet you if I talked with each one of you, I'd get those stories over and over again. So don't hear me saying it's not happening. I know it's happening. I'm just here to be your cheerleader, to give some of you hugs. I like hugs, by the way, so let's hug to give you hugs and to like cheer you on. Like we, my family and I might end up in Nashville. We're still, we might end up here. And if we do move here, it will be a joy and an honor to link arms with you to have these things happen right here in Nashville. So I would love to end. I would love to finish with these helpful words from one of my heroes, the great Nelson Mandela. Our human compassion binds us the one to the other, not in pity or patronizingly, but as human beings who have learned how to turn our common suffering into hope for the future. So thank you very much. I love you all. This has been great.